Folks, 10 years ago, I had the opportunity to preach this passage in Berlin. As my former ministry partner, Dieter, and I ordained a young man named Pascal Grosjean to the work of the ministry. And now we as Cornerstone Bible Church have the privilege of supporting Pascal and his wife, Bea Grosjean, as they plant yet another church in the heart of Berlin, Germany. In today's passage, we're going to see 10 characteristics that marked the Apostle Paul's ministry, making it one of the most effective and God-honoring ministries that this world has ever seen. And I really hope it'll be a challenge to you. I really do. And those characteristics that were needed so long ago are still needed today in our lives, in our ministries, just as they were 2,000 years ago. And folks, I honestly cannot think of a better text in the book of Acts than to end our summer series on the book of Acts than this one. Paul is addressing the elders of the Ephesians church. If you haven't opened your Bibles, please do to Acts chapter 20. And as Paul is addressing these elders to the Ephesians church, men whom he dearly loved and he never expected to see again. And so he pours out his heart to these men by giving them really 10 principles, right, that drove his own ministry throughout the years, imploring them, these shepherds, these under-shepherds, to take care of God's flock. But these principles are really applicable to each and every one of us. And the reason why is because we all, as believers, have, have been called into the ministry. Amen? Amen. If you're a Christian, listen to me very carefully, you are called into the ministry, all right? We're all called into the ministry. We're called to make disciples, right? And we're called to help mature one another, encourage one another in the body of Christ, building them up. So folks, if you have children, you have sheep. If you have grandchildren, you have sheep. If you're discipling people, you have sheep. And if you're a counselor, you have sheep. If you're, in, if you're an evangelist, you are trying to enlist sheep, right? So these ministry principles, I want to encourage you all. Listen, I know Paul was talking to elders, and I'll get to this. Paul was talking to under shepherds, but really... All of these principles are applicable to every single one of you, no matter what station of life you're in. So, in some way or another, you can apply these principles to your life. And men, my hope and desire for all of you here is to equip each one of you as if you were elders in this church. Now, I know that God has not called all of you to be elders in this church. I wish that were different, but... The character qualities which God requires in elders should be the goal of every single man in this church, all right? And really, the character qualities for deacons and elders are virtually the same. They really are. And you just have to look at 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. So with all that in mind, let's turn to Acts chapter 20, where Luke records for us 10 marks that characterize the apostle Paul's ministry. Now, as every good expositor should, he needs to set his context or his, his text in context, right? And that's what we always try to endeavor to do. Um, and so I want to give you guys the context. If you look in your outline there, it's 1A is context. So Paul was on his way to Jerusalem. And the ship that he and his companions were traveling on made a short stop in Miletus, which is about 30 miles south of Ephesus. Okay, you'll see that on the map behind me. Paul was, was hurrying to try to get to Jerusalem by Pentecost. But even though he was in a hurry, his genuine love and concern for this church compelled him to give one final exhortation to its leaders. 
So Paul sent and asked the elders in Ephesus to come and meet him in Miletus. Now, he could have traveled up to Ephesus, but I think he knew that that would delay him longer, right? It's hard to break away at a family reunion or from family or friends, right? Whenever I go to Germany, it's hard to say goodbye. And so I can imagine a beloved uh, apostle and shepherd trying to say, hey, this is going to be really hard. I'm just going to call a group of men down here, and, and, and I, I have one last exhortation for these guys. Paul loved the church in Ephesus. Remember, he planted this church. As a matter of fact, he had poured three years of his life into that church, and in particular, probably all of these men that he called down from Ephesus. They had grown to spiritual maturity under Paul's ministry, and now, like I said before, he had one final exhortation for these guys. So let's look at verses 18 and 19. Let's all stand together for the, at least this first couple of verses here. And the, the, the very first mark that characterized Paul's ministry was that he was a superb shepherd, in fact, I would say that he was a shepherd of shepherds. So let's read these first two verses together, standing as we read God's word. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials, which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. You may take your seat. It's probably one of the shortest texts we ever have to stand for and sit back down. Now, from these two verses alone, we see a number of things that distinguished the Apostle Paul's ministry and, and really him as being a superb shepherd of God's flock. First of all, and here it is, he spent time with the people. That might come as a shock to you, right? He spent time with the people. He said this, look at, look at verse 19 or 18, excuse me. He said, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time. In other words, Paul was not always locked up into his study, but he was with the people, he spent lots of time with them. He knew them and they knew him. They were his priority. And folks, I would just say this, that you need to be going to a church where you can get to know your shepherd, all right, or shepherds. And if the church is so big that you can't get to know them, then I would rethink where you're going to church. I try to spend usually Wednesdays and Thursdays, Mondays and Tuesdays are my sermon days, okay? Unless there's an emergency, I usually try to just focus on that. Wednesdays and Thursdays, I try to meet with people. So folks, I just want you to know, if you need to meet with me, please, just call our office, okay? I'd love to meet with, meet with you. Sometimes pastors and elders can be more in love with their books and their Bible software than they, can, than they are with their sheep, I should say. And they can preach great sermons, but they don't know much about the people in their congregations, and there's an old saying that I heard many years ago and many times over, and it's true. And it says this, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Would you guys agree with me? I, I, I think that's true. I really do. And as moms and dads, think about your children. That's true for you too. If you're always locked up in your home office or away at the office, right, and you don't have time for your children, and something's off. You need to make a change. Whoever your sheep are, don't substitute great didactic teaching times for consistent time spent with them. My pastor used to say this. I remember he asked me one time to pick up him and a bunch of the elders and deacons from the Shepherds Conference, and I was up in Bellingham, and I drove, I, drove, I think it was like, guessing three hours, I can't remember now, of Bellingham there, something like that. And I'm here to pick him up, big, big old bus, and he chastised me. He said, you drove all this way and you brought no one with you? He said, you could have been investing in them for those three dead hours. 
<laughs> I learned a lesson that day. Never to tell him what I'm doing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they won't be impressed by what you know if they don't feel that you really care about them. Again, parents, this applies to you, does it not? Dads, don't think that intense family devotions can take the place of simple life-on-life -life discipleship throughout the day. Another thing that made Paul a superb shepherd was the fact that he was first and foremost, get this, the Lord's servant. Look at verses 18 and 19 again. The last part of verse 18, the first part of verse 19. He says, you yourselves know from the very first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time. Here it is. What does it say next? Serving the Lord. Even while busy ministering to the men and women at Ephesus, Paul did not lose sight of the fact that he was first and foremost Christ's servant, seeking to please him and not men. My, oh my, what a change that is in so many pastorates today and so many churches today. Galatians 1.10 gives us a, a great warning about seeking to please men, Right? I really like the way one particular commentator put it. He said this, Serving God defines the motive for doing what is right in His sight above every other consideration. It means a preacher does not serve the will... Excuse me. That was my donut from last hour. It means a preacher does not serve the will and desires of the congregation or even the leaders of the church, but God. It means an employee does not merely serve an employer, but God. As Paul expressed it to the Colossians, it is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Amen? Men, when you go to work tomorrow, or ladies, when you go to work tomorrow, who do you serve? Is it your employer, your, the corporation you work for, or is it the Lord Jesus Christ? It must, it must, it must be Him and Him alone. Paul wasn't just a servant of the Lord, but he was also a humble servant of the Lord. Look what it says here, verse 19 still. He says, serving the Lord, what's the next three words? With all humility. I love that. Brothers and sisters, Paul was an incredibly accomplished academic. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, studied under the famous teacher Gamaliel. He was a successful businessman from a vocational viewpoint. He was a tent maker, no doubt, very successful. And he was an apostle. Who wouldn't want to attend from the apostle Paul? <laughs> yeah. Paul's my builder, right? I'd buy a tent from Paul. He was also an apostle from a spiritual viewpoint. But in spite of all of that as credential, he was still a humble servant. In his first letter to Timothy, Paul listed the qualifications from an el for an elder. And at the end of this list, this is what he said in, in chapter 3, verse 6. And he says, and not a new convert, so that, here it is, he will not be conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. Pride began in the angelic realm with the fall of Satan, did it not? He said, hey, I will, I will make my throne like the Most High. I will set myself up where God is. It was pride which caused his downfall. And then he dangled that same carrot, piece of fruit, right? Not a vegetable. But that same piece of fruit in front of Adam and Eve and said, you can be like God. In other words, appealing to their pride. But God's hated pride ever since the fall. And he hates all manifestations of pride. So guard your hearts, my dear brothers and sisters, against every form of pride. And we're all proud to one degree or another. It's a root sin. There's a lot of fruit sins that come out, right? Those are all different in each of our lives, guarantee. But there's, there's, there's some root sins, that all these other fruit sins spring out of, and pride is one, belief, or one of them. Selfishness and unbelief are the other two. 
So let's read verse 19 once again. It says, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which come upon me through the plots of the Jews. Another aspect of being a, a superb shepherd, and we're still looking at point one here, an excellent shepherd, is the fact that Paul was passionate. Paul was passionate. He served the Lord and ministered to the sheep. What did he say here? How do you describe it? With tears. Paul was not aloof. He was no stranger to the daily grind or the daily trials and temptations that his brothers and sisters were going through. He genuinely loved them and cared for their spiritual and physical well-being. And he wasn't afraid to show his emotion every once in a while. We also see in the last part of this verse that Paul was willing to endure hardship and suffering for his God for the church. In other words, Paul was certainly no hireling. He didn't abandon the sheep when the, when the, the heat was turned up, right? Despite the numerous plots of the Jews against Paul's life, he never left the flock without a shepherd. Paul faced all kinds of opposition as he faithfully served the Lord. And brothers and sisters, if we desire to serve God with our whole hearts, then we too will face opposition and persecution. And I believe as a, as a culture, as a country, we are just beginning with that. I really, really think that. I think we're at the cusp of a whole new um, time for Christianity in America. I hope I'm wrong. 2 Timothy 3.12 says this, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus. Is that you guys? That's me. And now look at the last part. Will be persecuted. You can bank on it. It will cost you something to be a Christian. And if it doesn't, something's probably wrong. One commentator put it like this, Some some judge the success of a servant of God by how large or widespread his ministry is, how many degrees he has or how much publicity he receives. But the true measure of a servant of God is whether he focuses solely on pleasing God, which gives him the willingness to serve with humility and suffer opposition from those hostile to the truth. Amen. Amen. Now look at verse 20 with me. Paul is also a thorough teacher. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable in teaching you publicly and from house to house. Paul was not only an excellent shepherd, but he was also a thorough teacher. Paul knew that teaching was one of his primary tasks as a shepherd. As, a, as an apostle. Listen to what he wrote to Ephesians, to the Ephesians in chapter 4. Same group of people. All right, this is just his letter that he wrote. He says this, and he, that's God, gave, that's to the church, right? He says, and he, so and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. Why, Paul? Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. That's why God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, folks. And that's why you should be going to a church where you can receive that. Unless, of course, you possess all those gifts in your little home, <laughs> right? Paul knew that the building up of the body of Christ could only be accomplished through the faithful preaching and teaching of God's truth. And notice that Paul said that he did not shrink from teaching them, what? Anything that was profitable. In other words, he held, no, he held nothing back, no doctrine, right? No exhortation, no admonition that was profitable. 
Paul is willing to lay it all out on the line simply because he loved the Lord first and foremost, and that love transferred down to a love to the people, and then he didn't care, right? Because <laughs> he was going to teach and train them. And in 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, Paul says that all of Scripture is what? Profitable. Then there is nothing in it which we should avoid teaching. Amen? Paul never changed his message because he thought someone would be offended, right? Furthermore, he also taught both, he, it says it here, he's taught both publicly and privately. In other words, a true servant of the Lord will teach wherever he is, whether in public teaching, in a public teaching situation, or in a private home teaching situation. There are different obviously different benefits which could accompany different venues for teaching, but Paul knew how to make the most out of every opportunity, whether there's two or 20 or 200 or maybe 2,000. Let's look at the next mark of the apostles' ministry. It's found in verse 21. Look at verse 21. Again, he's talking to these Ephesian elders who had come down from Ephesus. They're meeting in Miletus, right? And Paul was basically, hey, these are his final words. At least Paul said, hey, I, I, I'm never going to see you guys again. He says, this solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul didn't just talk about evangelism and sharing the gospel with the lost, he did it. In other words, he was an excellent evangelist as well. That's the third mark, all right? He was an excellent evangelist. He didn't just talk about missions, right? Wax eloquent about them, but he was intimately involved in them. Paul loved the gospel message and was utterly convinced of its truthfulness and of its power to to convince, convict, and convert the lost. Romans 1.16, Paul wrote, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, right? For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Amen. Then in his letter to the Corinthians, he said this in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Do you feel the same way, folks? Woe is you if you don't preach the gospel. When was the last time, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, when was the last time you shared the gospel with someone? I'm talking about the real gospel. When was the last time? Paul knew that no view of the ministry that failed to have a focus on reaching the loss could possibly be honoring to the Lord. Thus he wore not only the, the hat as a, as a pastor and, and shepherd and teacher to the flock of God that God entrusted to him, but he also wore the hat of what? An evangelist. He also wore that hat as well. And brothers and sisters, that same priority, that same responsibility goes to each and every one of us. We cannot focus solely on building up those within the flock of God. If we did that, we'd end up with a bunch of fat sheep, right? All the while turning a deaf ear to the, the bleeding and lost lambs outside of these four walls. Paul never neglected either group. He was faithful in discipleship and evangelism. Now look with me at verses 22 and 23. Look at the next, the next mark. And now behold, bound in the spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. Another mark of faithful ministry is one's rock-solid belief in God's sovereignty. All right? Now, it's easy to proclaim belief in God's sovereignty when everything is going fine and dandy, correct? Everything's going your way. Of course, I believe in God's sovereignty. Look how he's blessed me, right? 
But what about those times when things are difficult, dangerous, or even life-threatening? What about those times? Do we, what, what about on November 4th, right? How are we going to respond when things don't go our way? How do you respond to God's sovereignty then? And that's the real test, is it not? That's the real test. The apostle was certainly no stranger to that test. Paul said that he was, look at the words here, he says he was bound by the Spirit. In other words, whatever affliction, whatever suffering or imprisonment that awaited him in Jerusalem, Paul was perfectly good with God's sovereignty and him going forward with whatever awaited him. And as we've already seen, he knew that he was first and foremost a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he gladly put aside his own will for the sake of doing his master's will. Jesus said this in Luke 6, 46. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord? Do you know what the last part says? And do not do what I say? Some of you call him Lord, Lord, too, and don't do what he says. And we need to check ourselves, correct? We all do. We all do. I'm not just pointing fingers at anybody. Now, I know you all know Romans 8, 28, right? And so I just want to encourage you that no matter where our Lord may call you to go or what he may call you to do, never lose sight of the fact that God has in mind the absolute best possible plan for you and your family. Folks, if I die today... Is that a tragedy? Please don't say yes. (laughs) I'll be in God's presence. Do I have to fear death? I don't care if it comes through cancer or a car wreck or COVID-19. You should not fear death. If you're a believer, you shouldn't be in fear of death. What are you doing with that timidity, right? No. Any account as dear to myself, praise God. And there it is right there, right? He says this, so that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Paul is faithful to his calling. That's number five on your outline. And this point follows naturally on the heels of Paul's confidence in God's sovereignty. Only one thing mattered to Paul, and that was to finish the work that God had called him to do. Even his own life was insignificant in comparison to the utter importance of faithfully fulfilling his calling. Brothers and sisters, we must never forget how important faithfulness is to our faithful God. Does God want to see faithfulness in you and I? You bet he does. As a matter of fact, that's the only thing that he requires of you and me. 1 Corinthians 4.2 says this, Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found, let's say productive, that you lead 100 people to know the Lord in your lifetime, you start a, 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 a ministry, right? A 501c3. He says that one be found faithful. That's it. He calls you and I to faithfulness. Paul was faithful to his calling. In other words, he never quit. He never quit. Are you, are you feeling like quitting, folks? You feeling like quitting? If you do, please come and talk to me. Let's pray. Because God just wants you to be faithful. And I know this whole wide world and Satan would like nothing better than to peel you off. For what? So he can play games with you? Or Paul himself. Maybe a verse a day keeps the devil away. The answer is you won't be able to do that. Now look at verses 28 through 31 with me. Where we see the seventh mark. Shepherd, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing. Full shepherd is that he is always please life on guard for heart richard baxter writes take heed to yourselves 
lest you live in those sins which you preach against in others, and lest you be guilty of that which daily you condemn. Will you make it your work to magnify God, and when you have done, dishonor Him as much as others? Will you proclaim Christ's governing power and yet condemn it and rebel yourselves? Will you preach His laws and willfully break them? And I like how he says this next. He says, if sin be evil, why do you live in it? If it, be, if it be not, why do you dissuade men from it? If it be dangerous, how dare you venture on it? If it be not, why do you tell men so? If God's threatenings be true, why do you not fear them? If they be false, why do you needlessly trouble men with them and put them into such frights without a cause? Do you know the judgment of God that they who commit such things are worthy of death, and yet will you do them? Thou that teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Take heed to yourselves, lest you cry down sin, and yet do not overcome it. Lest while you seek to bring it down in others, you bow to it and become its slaves yourselves. From, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. To whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. He said this, O brethren, it is easier to chide at sin than to overcome it. Wow. Now, if you didn't get all of that, go back and read it on our slides, okay? (laughs) On our website. May we all be on guard. First of all, for our own spiritual lives, you guys. It starts there, right? And then we'll see clearly to help our brothers or sisters in need, wherever they're at. And then we can see things clearly. It's a, it's a log spec principle, right? We need to first take the log out of our own eye so that we can see clearly to take the speck out of our brother's sister's eye. Now look at our text once again. Verse 28, he says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. He says this, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Not only were the Ephesian elders to be on guard for themselves to make sure that they weren't hypocrites, right? But for the spiritual well-being of the flock as well. Folks, it's not enough for the shepherd to feed and lead his flock. Do you guys realize that? We need to do three things. It's usually we need to lead, feed, and protect, all right, as shepherds. But it's not enough just to feed and lead. Sheep are defenseless creatures. No big long fangs, no no cat-like claws, right? So he must also, the shepherd must also be on guard 24-7 to protect against predators. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul said that savage wolves from the outside would do everything they could to come in to devour the flock, right? And folks, we're seeing that on the horizons, are we not? We're seeing that whether it's through Olympia or Washington, D.C., they're coming. They really are. But then he also said that there would be enemies from where? From within. From within the church that would arise and try to draw the disciples away to follow after them. And we've had some men like that in this congregation over the years. We really have. So, brothers and sisters, let us stay vigilant for the good of the whole flock, guarding against the savage wolves from outside the church and the false teachers from within the church. And only when we've armed ourselves with this book and we know what it says can we test everything against the perfect backdrop. And then we'll be effective in guarding ourselves and our, and our fellow flock, right, our members, from these attacks from both outside and within the church. 
Now, in light of all that's come before, it's no wonder that our, that our next verse shows that Paul was a man of prayer and a man of the word. Look at verse 32. This is, this is number eight, commitment to prayer and God's word. He says, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So when Paul says, I commend you to God, he means that, that, that he would pray for these elders and these leaders, these pastors and teachers. And Paul understood that all his strength came from prayer and the word. Early on in the life of the church, the other apostles clearly understood prayer and the word to be their top priorities as well. Remember this, Acts 6-4, we talked about that several weeks ago. They said this, the, the, the apostle says, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Remember that? The early church lived in a constant atmosphere of prayer. And beyond a shadow of doubt, Paul was a man who sincerely believed in prayer. One commentator said the following, he says, there is no substitute for prayer. For prayer acknowledges dependence on God and lines us up with his purposes. Prayer also allows God to glorify himself by answering John 14, 13. Without it, the under shepherd's attempts to feed, lead, and guard the flock will be in vain. Good intentions, good ideas, or good programs cannot overcome the effectiveness of prayerlessness, end quote. Men, are you praying with your wives each and every day? Are you praying for your own spiritual well-being and then the spiritual well-being of your flock and maybe the, the disciples that you're making and maybe the, the, the people you're trying to reach out to and evangelize, right? Your pre-disciples. <laughs> maybe when we don't see any work going on, at least from our perspective, it's because we're not praying enough. I would, I would pose that for you all to take time to really contemplate. And God's word is the other foundational pillar of any God-honoring ministry. So it's prayer in the word, prayer in the word. And it's essential that any leader of God's church be a man of this book. It really is. And both prayer and the word must be the top priority of any shepherd who wishes to honor his Lord and King through his service. But that goes for all of us, you guys, all of us. And if they're not his top priority, then both he and his flock will suffer greatly. Parents, once again, the same goes for you. If prayer and the word are not a top priority in your own personal life, if they're not a top priority in your own personal marriage, in your own home, then both you and your family will suffer greatly. You will. You'll get discouraged especially when times get tough, right? But that's why we need, we need, we need to be encouraged and motivated to stay in God's word, stay in God's word, stay in prayer. By staying in God's word, you will be praying, all right? You really will. Now, the ninth mark of an excellent shepherd is that he is a hard worker. He is a hard worker. I love this photo, by the way. <laughs> Look at verses 33, 34, and 35. Paul writes, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands minister to my own needs and to the men who are with me. In everything, I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Folks, I've heard it said in the past that the ministry, being in the pastorate, can be either the, one of the hardest jobs on this planet or one of the easiest. And the reason why it could be one of the easiest is because people are typically not looking over the pastor's shoulder, holding him accountable to his work ethic. And over the years, I have witnessed a number of lazy men in the ministry, I'm sad to say. However, that's not the example that the Apostle Paul left behind for us. Paul was a hard worker, not just in the spiritual realm of preaching and teaching and counseling, 
but in the realm of physical labor as well. He worked with his own two hands so that he wasn't a burden on anyone and so that he could give others around him in his congregation a good example of what he's supposed to be doing. And there's an old saying, and you've heard it, I'm sure, idle hands are the devil's workshop. Oh, how true that is. This can be true of anyone. Some of the most difficult people I have ever, ever had to deal with, both in East, former East Berlin, and also here in Washington State, have been those who have had idle hands. I mean that. Too much time on their hands. Too much time to, to watch this video, look up that thing on the internet, get caught up in that, that sin, right? Or that hobby. I believe this passage also deals with a related issue. Paul was a hard worker, but he was not preoccupied with money. In Hebrews 13, 5, all believers are commanded to make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. We just saw that video for Compassion Sunday, right? Folks, I'd love it if we had all of these children that we're going to present to you on that Sunday adopted. I mean that. As one author noted, a truly God-honoring life and ministry must focus on giving, not getting. Brothers and sisters, God will not bless you or your ministry if you're in any way preoccupied with money. And the love of money or materialism is a mark of a false teacher, not that of a true and faithful disciple and slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love how the Lord communicated this thought in the Sermon on the Mount. He said this in Matthew 6, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So what were all these things that the Lord was referring to? Oh, just look at the context. Just go read the verses beforehand. And he was actually answering the common questions that people have. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? And what shall we wear for clothing? Sounds kind of similar, right? And our Lord's answer to those men and women who heard him on that day when he was teaching his most famous sermon of all times is that he said this, but seek first your 401k, right? A good investment policy, good return on your... No, he said, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. My father-in-law was once approached by a young Brazilian man. He was there, him and his wife were there for 59 years in the middle of the jungle. And this young man asked him if he would teach him to be a preacher. And Bill wisely asked him this question, why do you want to be a preacher? Because I don't want to spend my life working my fingers to the bone on a farm admitted the young man candidly. Now, needless to say, that was the wrong perspective, right? That was the wrong perspective. Paul was not in the ministry for a salary or for a cushy job, for a retirement plan or anything else like that. He poured his life into the people day and night, and then he worked on the side, and it says, so as not to be a burden to any one of you guys. I didn't covet anything from you guys. You guys know that. But these hands of mine, right, work not only for my own needs, but for the, the, the needs of the people on my team. Now let's look on to the last mark of a faithful ministry. It's found in verses 36 through 38. When he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they began to weep aloud and embraced Paul and repeatedly kissed him, grieving, especially over the word which he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And they were accompanying him to the ship. The last mark of a faithful shepherd is really the result of a truly God-honoring ministry. And that is that Paul was loved by the sheep. And for good reason as well. For good reason. After Paul's exhortation to these 
men was finished. He, they all knelt down on the sand together. Paul's ship was getting ready to sail, and so he didn't have a whole lot of time left. And after they had prayed together, they began to weep aloud and they embraced each other and repeatedly kissed each other. And the shepherd, Paul, and the picture that Luke records for us here is truly an emotional one. It's very much like that of an intimate family when one of their much-loved family members must leave home. And clearly these men love their shepherd. Brothers and sisters, Paul's ministry was not successful because he was full of new and innovative plans for church growth. He was the Lord's servant, he was humble, he was passionate, and he was willing to suffer. Paul was all those things. Second, Paul was a tremendous teacher. He taught everything that was profitable, both publicly and privately. Third, he was an excellent evangelist. Paul took evangelism seriously, and so should we if we want to hear, well done, my good and faithful slave. Enter into your master's rest. Fourth, he trusted God's sovereignty. Even when he had to suffer, he carried on trusting God and ministering to those around him, knowing that God had him in exactly the right spot where he wanted him. Fifth, he was faithful to his calling. He was unconcerned about his own life because he was focused on finishing faithfully. Folks, I believe the Lord's coming quickly. Do you see that day drawing near? As Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, just turn on the news. (laughs) I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful slave. I hope you do too. Paul requires that we are just faithful, that we're found faithful. So be faithful and well. Six, he was faithful to his flock. He was faithful in evangelism and faithful in discipleship, right? There's nothing that Paul did not teach and train them in. Seventh, he was always on guard. Again, he was on guard for himself. He watched over his own life and heart. And folks, that's where your prayer life needs to begin. Oh, Lord, watch over my heart. Watch over my mind, right? Make sure it's right before you. And then you'll see clearly to help somebody else with theirs. Eighth, he was a man of prayer and the word. These were his priorities. It was simple. And he didn't get sidetracked from them. How are you doing? Folks, how are you doing? Men, young men, old men, ladies, young ladies, old ladies, how are you doing? I should say older ladies, sorry. You know what I meant. Ninth, he was a hard worker. Paul worked hard. Folks, I know this is not a part of our culture. It's not. My brother, who's, who employs several people, and I'm not talking about any of you here, but he says, I cannot tell you how hard it is to find simply somebody who's willing to work hard nowadays. I can't do it. His, he barely can find somebody. Is that not permeated our culture? Okay. But has it permeated you who should be different than the culture or me? He worked hard to provide our children. It's my last page, so stay with me. Do we pour God's word into our lives so that we can minister effectively to other people from that overflow? And do we bathe each day in prayer so that our children learn to take everything to prayer, uh, to God in prayer themselves? And what about our relationships within the church? Are we doing all that we can to encourage one another to learn and follow the whole counsel of God? And do we share the glorious gospel of grace with unsaved friends. It changed our lives. So do we share it with others, knowing that it can share theirs as well, or change theirs as well? Sorry, I do have another half page. Just realize that. Brother and sisters, we are responsible for the relationships that God has placed within our sphere. Correct? So let us follow the example of the Apostle Paul, 
and be faithful in ministering in the context in which each one of these relationship that he's given us for the glory of God. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for just bringing us to the end of the summer. I didn't even, didn't even know if we'd make it, Lord. But Lord, I, I thank you for every day that you do give us. And I pray for faithfulness, not just for myself and my wife and my children, but my beloved church family, this family of believers. Lord, please work in all of our lives. Help us to model our ministry after the Apostle Paul's that we, so, that we see so clearly laid out for us in Acts chapter